Thanks very much indeed. My name is Mark Jones. I'm a vet by training, and for the past five years I've been with the Born Free Foundation, uh, where I'm currently its head of policy. Uh, many thanks to the organisers for inviting myself and my colleague Chris, who you'll hear from shortly, and um, for the really excellent sessions uh, we've had so far. And I think Polly Taylor's talk in particular this morning uh, has real resonance for this, this particular issue. Um, I wanted to start really by setting the scene and outlining why, uh, when considering the welfare impacts of captivity, we need to consider the impacts across the entire trade and supply chain. Um, I'm sure we're all aware that wildlife and nature are being depleted by human activities at an unprecedented rate. The, the recent uh, UN Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services report um, said that a million species might be threatened with extinction and talked of the transformative changes that are needed to restore and protect nature and the need to overcome what it called opposition from vested interests for public good. And that's quite strong language for a, a UN, um, UN organisation. And direct exploitation of organisms, primarily for trade of one kind or another, uh, was identified as the second most significant driver of declines behind changes in land and sea use. Now, the international trade in wildlife, and again, I'm sure you're very aware of this, uh, is huge. Um, its commercial value uh, globally is measured in hundreds of billions of dollars. It involves literally billions of animals and plants. It's been growing pretty much exponentially in recent years. And it involves both legal and illegal trade. Um, the former, at least to some degree, is regulated by international agreement and national legislation. But of course, the latter uh, is unregulated, hard to quantify, and even harder to prevent. And trade in live animals uh, forms a significant uh, component of that wildlife trade. And there are some official sources of information that help us to understand something of its scale, at least in terms of the legal trade. Um, the UN Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or CITES, uh, maintains a database of permits issued for the trade in species listed on its appendices. And if we look at, the, uh, if we look at a bit of the data extracted from that database for just one year, uh, it gives you an idea of the kind of numbers of live animals that are traded between countries for one reason or another um, that's been go that, that, that goes on. Um, for that year, 2016, there were more than 17,000 recorded international transactions involving more than 5 million live animals. And in terms of what's coming into the UK or what's, what's being exported to the UK, uh, the database um, uh, showed up 30,000 reptiles, about 800 mammals, 260 birds. Now, of course, these are just the official records of legal exports of CITES listed species. They don't include trade in unlisted species or domestic trade or illegal trade. So the total numbers of live animals in trade will be very, very much higher than, than these figures suggest. Many of these animals are taken from the wild. Many more may be bred in captivity. And a significant proportion will be destined for the exotic pet markets. Now, um, accurate estimates for the numbers of exotic animals held in captivity in the UK are perhaps quite hard to come by. I did have a look at the uh, figures from the Pet Food Manufacturers Association's Pet Population Report for 2017 when I was putting this together, um, uh, which said that from a total pet population of around 54 million, UK households are probably home to 30 or 40 million fish, 700,000 reptiles and about the same number of caged birds. Um, but some of these figures may be gross underestimates. Um, Ten years ago, the Federation of British Herpetologists estimated that there might be as, mil as many as 8 million reptiles and amphibians in UK people's homes. So, you, you know, the estimates are out there, but we have to take them with a little bit of a pinch of salt. And in addition, there are more than 300 registered zoos and aquaria across the UK, holding many thousands of exotic animals. Uh, last year, uh, at Born Free, uh, 
uh, under Chris's stewardship, we did a, a snapshot survey of local authority records of animals licensed under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act here in the UK, which we've heard a little bit about already. And this research uh, revealed that almost 5,000 DWA licensed animals included almost 300 wild cats, of which 40 uh, or more than 40 were big cats, over 700 venomous snakes and lizards, at least 240 primates and more than 75 crocodilians. And it's highly likely that there are many more animals than this that, sh that are listed under the Act that, the, the act that should be licensed but are being held without licenses. Now, whether the welfare of these animals is being adequately cared for is not clear, since the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, as we've heard, is not primarily welfare-focused legislation. And while the owners of the animals should be complying with the Animal Welfare Act and any associated codes of practice, such as for primates, the licensing system under the DWA doesn't, doesn't adequately cover for, for the investigation of whether this is happening. In 2015, Born Free and the Blue Cross investigated almost 1,800 online advertisements for exotic pets across the UK over a three-month period. And those advertisements featured 53 species of reptile, 37 types of exotic bird, 28 different exotic mammals, and seven amphibian species. And there was a lack of even basic animal care advice, and many of the ads gave indications that, that the animals being advertised might be in <coughs> poor health. Some of them advertised animals for quick sale or swap. And really what we concluded was that the availability of exotic species in pet shops and online can give the false impression to potential pet owners that they're an easy or perhaps in some cases cheaper alternative than a <coughs> traditional domestic pet. And species uh, may even be promoted as requiring less time and or resources than companion animals such as dogs and cats, sending what we think is a very, very misrepresentative message to consumers. So the uh, report, the one click away report, highlighted that while the Pet Animals Act makes it an offence to sell animals as pets in any part of a street, road, road, public place or at a stall, animals are still available to buy at such markets in Germany and other European countries and various pet shops in the UK exhibit at or advertise coach trips to European markets on their websites. And again, this raises concerns that unknown numbers of animals are entering the UK pet trade from overseas markets every year. So we really concluded that the legislation to protect the welfare of animals in trade for the exotic pet market in the UK is both inadequate and outdated. Um, the RSPCA reported recently that during 2018 they received almost 15,000 calls to their 24-hour cruelty hotline relating to exotic pets and rescued more than 4,000 such animals across England and Wales and they included almost 1,000 reptiles, everything from raccoon dogs to primates and even a wallaby. Um, and inadequate research into the keeping of the, their animals um, by the owners was cited as a significant cause of the problems and resulted in animals, many animals, escaping or being abandoned or neglected. So if we consider welfare concerns to be a function of the intensity and duration of compromise or suffering experienced by an individual and the number of animals who suffer or whose welfare is compromised, the extent of welfare, welfare concerns when it comes to exotic animals in captivity here in the UK is clearly very significant indeed. Um, so what I'm really hoping to convey is that the term exotic animals encompasses a huge variety of different species with vastly different, differing, often extremely complex needs. And with rarity and novelty being significant drivers of demand uh, in some parts of, parts of the exotic pet trade, the welfare needs of these animals are hard and often impossible to meet. Indeed, they're often just very poorly understood, full stop. And all too often, uh, those welfare needs are completely overlooked uh, by traders um, through uh, sort of economies of scale in trade. So just to sort of sum up, when considering the question of whether we can meet the welfare needs of exotic animals in captivity, we need to consider the welfare implications across the entire supply chain 
on the target animals themselves. And also, let's not forget the other con specifics that might also be affected by that trade, including through collection from the wild, captive breeding, the conditions at holding centres, throughout transport at the point of sale, right through to the end destination. Um, our concern for the welfare of every exotic animal in someone's home or some other captive facility in the UK needs to extend to all those animals whose welfare might have been compromised through the supply chain uh, that ended up with that animal where it was. And I argue that we're currently failing uh, to meet the needs of a high proportion of animals in or affected by the trade that has built up to provide exotic animals for cap captive use. And I also argue that for many species, we will never be able to do so. Thank you very much.